Every football team has a playbook, and it's filled with all the plays that that team is going to run over the course of the year. And as the year progresses, they'll actually add plays to the playbook. But for each game, what the coaches will do is they will select a certain number of plays they call a game plan, which is a collection of plays that they believe that if they run those plays against this certain opponent, they'll have success over that other team. Often they'll print these plays of the game plan on a laminated card for the coaches, just like this. And then for the quarterbacks, they'll put all of the game plan on a wristband so that they have access to the entire game plan. Not all of the plays in the playbook, but the specific plays they think will be successful during that game against that specific opponent. Well, over this next section of the letter in 1 Peter that we're going to look at today, what Peter does is he says, hey, when you're facing difficulty, here's three plays that I want you to run. Because I think you're going to have great success when you run these three plays. So if you're facing trials right now, or you're facing criticism or persecution because of your faith, these are the plays that Peter wants us to be mindful of. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter, the third chapter. We're going to start with verse 8. And I'm going to ask you to do something maybe I don't normally ask. And that is, I would strongly encourage you to take notes during this message. Because there are a lot of moving parts in this, in this section of Scripture. There's a lot of different components to these three different plays. And just as if one guy misses a block on a, on a on a football play, the whole play can kind of uh, not have success. Well, there is some merit to this. All of these things are really important. So I want to encourage you to write this stuff down, fill in the blanks on the program that you got when you came in, and then over the course of the next few days, maybe just reflect on them as you, pr- as you spend some time in prayer. So let's take a look at these three plays that are on our wristband, if you will, or on our laminated card. To run, that we need to run in order to have victory during tough times. The first one is this cultivate a Christ like love. Cultivate a Christ like love. Listen to what verse 8 says. Peter writes, Finally, all of you, be like minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Now, we've talked about this previously, but one of the common themes throughout this entire letter is the topic of love. Peter's talking about it all the time. And to have success cultivating Christ-like love, you and I, Peter points out, for you and I, Peter points out that we need to begin by showing Christ-like love to the church. Showing Christ-like love to the church. Peter writes to the Christians in Asia Minor who are reading this letter, and he says, you have to love God's people. You have to have love for God's people. In fact, the entire Old Testament is summed up by this idea of love. Paul says in Romans, the 13th chapter, he says, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. He's talking about the Old Testament law. So the entirety of human relationships is fulfilled in love. And this applies to every Christian and in every area of life. So what Peter does in this verse is he gives us kind of uh, some insight to the evidences of Christ-like love that's found in the church. The first evidence that he gives us is that we would be united in the mission. Be united in the mission. Peter uses the phrase, be like-minded. And the idea here is unity. Now, unity doesn't mean uniformity. It, It means cooperation in the midst of our diversity. And we are diverse. We're different. The members of the body of Christ, they work together in unity to accomplish their mission, even though they may be different. And there's a lot of diversity here. Christians may differ on how they think things should be done, but they always agree, or they should, on what is to be done. And that's the Great Commission. That's what we're chasing. Whatever methods we might use, they may change in the future. They may be different than what they were in the past. But we must strive to fulfill the Great Commission and honoring Jesus in the process. We're going to go after those who are outside of the family of God. We want to win them over to a belief in Jesus. And then we want to build up the church through discipleship. We may be different, but we're united in our mission, Peter says. 
We have, every Monday, I have a standing meeting at 2 o'clock. And almost every week we have this meeting. And it's, the cre- it's what we call around here our creative team. And what we do is we evaluate what happens on Sunday, and then we plan the future services in the, for the weeks to come. And the reason I mention this team is that this group is, is very different. It's a combination of a lot of people who are uniquely different from one another, but the team works really well together. Our individual uniquenesses make us better. In fact, we have a broader perspective because we come from different vantage points, different perspectives. We have more creativity because we're not all thinking from the same perspective. Some of the best ideas that have come out of this group, initially I thought were kind of duds, you know? I thought, well, that's lame. And then what happens? The synergy of that group takes this rough idea and out of it it produces this gem. The key is that God brought us together and we will all because of this common purpose that we share, we work to create the best experience that we can create so that people will have an encounter with God. And it works. So we need to be united around the mission. That's the first evidence. The second evidence that we have of Christ-like love in the church is to, work, is to walk together through the storms. Walk together through the storms. The Apostle Peter writes, he says, be sympathetic, which means to have sincere feelings for and with, an, and with the needs of others. Paul put it this way. He said, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. If we're going to be sympathetic with each other, if we're going to have Christ-like love for one another, we're going to be sympathetic with each other. If we're going to be sympathetic, we must share the joys and the trials of each other. The third evidence that Peter gives in this verse 8, that, the, that there is Christ-like love in the church, is when we show genuine concern for believers. Peter writes, be compassionate. You know, love reveals itself in compassion. This is having a tender, tender-heartedness toward others. You know, today we're swamped with so much bad news that it's easy for us to become numb to the struggles of people around us. We need to cultivate compassion and actively show others that we're concerned about them. Well, the fourth evidence that he gives us is of Christ-like love within the church is that we put others first. Peter writes, he says, be humble, (laughs) be humble. One of the best explanations of humility in all of the New Testament is what Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians, the second chapter. He says this, If in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, for the humble person puts others ahead of himself. Peter, previously in this letter, encouraged the Christians of Northern Asia Minor to love each other and to get rid of all envy and malice and all other attitudes that might undermine their relationships. And the reason for that was in the situation in which they were in, they faced a constant struggle from people outside of the church. And it is especially important for them to unite together in love for the sake of each other. And that's true for us. We need one another, and we need to show love toward each other. It's what binds us together. So show Christ-like love to the church. Well, Peter continues by explaining this play to cultivate Christ-like love, and he does it in verse 9. He continues in verse 9. He says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing." Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now here, Peter gives another facet of this play to cultivate Christ-like love. He gives this instruction. If we want to have success, he says, show Christ-like love to your enemies. Show Christ-like love to your enemies. The people reading this letter were experiencing a certain amount of persecution because they were doing the will of God. 
And the church today had better be prepared because they're all the indicators say that there are difficult times ahead for the church. Dave Stone, who's the lead minister of Southeast Christian in Louisville, one of the largest churches in America, spoke two weeks ago here in Lexington on the topic of the future of the church, how to thrive and not merely survive in the coming years. And one of the points that Dave made during his talk was that the church is headed for a period of persecution. There's going to be some serious opposition and criticism coming toward the church There will be pressure to compromise certain biblical principles because there are people within the culture that find those principles offensive. There will be more attempts to smear pastors' character and their reputation and paint entire churches as bigoted or hate-filled and extremists because they promote the Bible. Dave encouraged us that we need to prepare for this. And you know, one of the ways to prepare to show Christ's love is to love our enemies. If we want to prepare for challenging times to come, we need to show Christ's love toward our enemies today. You know, as human beings, we live life on one of three levels. The most base level is when we return evil for good. When someone does something good for us and we return evil for that, that is the satanic level. The next level is when we return good for good or evil for evil. And that is, that is basically the human level. But the level where Christians are encouraged to live is up here, where we return good when someone does evil to us. That's what Peter's talking about here. And that's called the divine level. And it's important, if we're going to live on this level, to remember who we are. He said we must always be reminded of our calling. As Christians, this will help us to love our enemies and do good to them, even when they treat us badly. We're called, we're called in such a way, as Christians, so that we may inherit a blessing, Peter says. Inherit a blessing. The persecutions we experience, the opposition, the criticism, the neglect that we experience on this earth today only add to our inheritance and glory in heaven someday. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. He said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus said, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We will inherit a blessing when we get to heaven. But here's the interesting thing. We can also inherit a blessing today when we treat our enemies with love and mercy. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just telling you, this is part of the play that Peter's calling. If we want to have a success during tough times. So we should love the church, we should love our enemies, and then Peter says we should love life. Now what's he talking about? Well, if you want to cultivate Christ-like love, He says, show Christ-like love by loving life. Look what verses 10 through 12 say. Peter writes, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The news of impending persecution should not cause a believer to give up on life. What it may appear to be bad days to the world can be good days to the Christian. If they take Peter's advice here. And he gives us certain conditions that we should follow. Listen to what he says. He says, deliberately decide to love life. Now, you can decide to endure life and then life becomes a burden. Or you can try to escape life like you would if you were running away from a battle. Or you can choose to enjoy life because you know that God is in control. Peter's urging his readers here to take a positive approach to life and by faith make the most out of every situation you find yourself in. Second condition he gives us to follow is he says, control your tongue. 
Man, I always love this, and I say that sarcastically when I come across a portion of Scripture that talks about the tongue, because nothing resonates with me more than, than these passages. Anybody identify with that? I can tell you many of the problems of life are caused by wrong words spoken with the wrong spirit. And I found that even if you have the right spirit, but you say the wrong words, you can still hurt people's feelings, or offend them. I cannot tell you how many times I have apologized for something that I have said in the attempt to try to be funny. Yeah, I thought it was funny, and they got offended. And I was right, it was funny, but they still got offended. They got their feelings hurt, or they got mad, and and the truth is this, I never wanted to do that. That was never the intent. So what do I do? I apologize. And I found that it's easier not to say anything than it is to have to go back and apologize because they, you want to make it right. You want it to be right. So control your tongue, Peter says. And then the third condition that he gives us, he says, do good and hate evil. And I love the Greek here, okay? He uses this, this term. He says, turn from evil and do good. And the term there, my, your Bible may say turn away from or turn from. It, it means to avoid something because you despise it and you loathe it. It's not enough, Peter says, for us to just avoid sin because it's wrong, but we ought to totally reject it because we hate it. And we know what it will do. We've seen what it does in people's lives, and we hate it so badly, we turn from it. He says, do good and hate evil. And then the fourth condition that he gives us here is he says, seek, the purpose, seek and pursue peace. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. Seek and pursue peace. Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This doesn't mean that we pursue peace at any cost. Righteousness must always be the basis for our peace. But it simply means that Christians exercise wisdom as we, he or she relates to people. And we don't create problems because we want to get our own way. I love what Romans 12, 18 says. This is one of those verses you should underline in your Bible. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, me, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes peace is not possible, but you and I must make our best effort to achieve it. It doesn't come automatically. Sometimes you're going to have to put your shoulder in to giving an effort to procure peace. When we talk about showing Christ-like love, a question kind of pops up in in the context of this study. And that is, what if our enemies take advantage of that? I mean, if they're giving us evil and we're responding with good, what if they take advantage of that? Listen to what Peter did. Peter gave the persecuted church the assurance that God's eyes were on them and his ears were open to their prayers. He, he says that in verse 12 of our text. We must trust God to protect and provide for he alone is the, the sole entity that can defeat every one of our enemies. A good day for the believer who loves life is not one in which he or she is pampered or sheltered, but instead it's one that he or she experiences God's help and blessing because of life's struggles. You'll see God working in the midst of those challenging times. So the first play on our wristband, on our, on our laminated card here from this letter, is to run, if we're going to run to secure victory in troubled times, is to cultivate Christ-like love. The second victory, the second play we need to run for victory is to revere Jesus as Lord. Revere Jesus as Lord. Listen to what Peter writes in verses 13 through 15. He says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. In verse 14 of this section, Peter quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. 
And the setting of Isaiah uttering that, that ab, ab, affirmation, encouragement, is significant. The background is he's having a conversation with King Ahaz, who is the king of Judah. Judah was facing an impending uh, invasion from the Assyrian army, huge army. And the kings of Israel and Syria, not to be confused with us, Syria, they had come to Ahaz and asked Ahaz to join their coalition to stand up and fight against the Assyrians. But Ahaz said no, and so it so frustrated the kings of Israel and Syria, they threatened to invade Judah. So now everybody wants to invade Judah. But what what Ahaz was doing behind the scenes was he was aligning himself with this powerful Assyrian army. That's when the prophet Isaiah comes and he warns Ahaz and he says, don't be making ungodly alliances. He urged him to trust God for his deliverance. As Christians, we face crisis all the time. And we're tempted to give in to our fears. And we're tempted to make wrong decisions once we're operating out of fear. But like, like Ahaz, we need to not be afraid. Because when God is with us, we're in the majority. We're in the majority. If we revere Jesus as Lord, we never need to fear man or circumstances. Now, generally speaking, Peter points out something I think is kind of interesting in the midst of this talk about persecution and everything, he says, people do not oppose us usually when we do good to them. Have you found that to be true? Yeah. And then he goes on and he said, but even if they do, it's better to suffer for righteousness' sake than to compromise our testimony. Your testimony is really important. In fact, in verse 15, Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. I like the word he uses there for answer in the Greek. It's the word apologia, which means to give a defense presented in court. It's where we get our word apologetics. Apologetics is that branch of theology that deals with the defense of, the, of our faith. And every Christian should be able, Peter says, to give an apologia or an informed defense of his or her faith in Jesus. This testimony, Peter says, needs to be given with gentleness and respect and not, not out of arrogance. Nobody, nobody likes a know-it-all. You and I, we're witnesses. We're not prosecuting attorneys. Every Christian should be able to give this informed defense, but we should do it with gentleness and respect. And it's key to being a believable witness, being respectful being gentle, but we must also make sure that our lives back up our testimony. You think about it. When we make an impassioned claim about one issue or another in life, we wield strong influence with people around us, but that's all lost when they find out that you and I don't comply with what, we, at what our own advice was. Let me give you an example. You've ever been around someone who complains about the government? Every level. They, they're, bad about, they're mad about city government. They're mad about state government. They're mad about federal government. Always got a problem with somebody in government. And then you find out that they never vote. <laughs> you go, dude, you have a chance to change it. And you're beefing about it all the time. Or maybe this resonates with you. You will give your kids lectures, anybody who will listen to you about texting and driving. And that's all fine until everybody finds out that periodically you text and drive. We lose our credibility when our lives don't match our message, don't we? Peter didn't suggest that Christians should argue with lost people, but rather we should present to them information of what we believe and why we believe it. And we should do it in a kind way. The purpose is not to win an argument. It's to win people to Jesus. We want them to know him. We don't want them to miss out on eternity with him. So the first play we need to run, if we want to have victory in difficult times, is to cultivate a Christ-like love. And the second is we need to revere Jesus as Lord. And then the third one, third play on a wristband, is maintain a good conscience. 
maintain a good conscience. Listen to what verses 16 and 17 Peter writes. He says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. The conscience that we have, our conscience, your conscience, my conscience, is like an internal judge that witnesses to us. It's either approving our actions or it's rebuking our actions. You know when you're doing something wrong. Most of us do, right? Our conscience could be compared to a window that allows light to come through, the light of God's truth. It shines in and it illuminates what, what is good and what is bad. Our conscience can be, can, though, if we persist to be disobeying, disobeying the word of God. Our conscience can be like a window that gets dirt on it. And the more we sin, the dirtier it gets. And until the light can enter through it, this leads to a defiled conscience. Now, a seared conscience, the Bible talks about searing your conscience. That's an even worse condition. It's one that has been sinned against so much that it's no longer sensitive to what is right and what is wrong. And it's even possible for your conscience to even be more damaged, more poisoned, that it approves of things that are wrong and it disapproves or criticizes when people do good. That's what the Bible calls an evil conscience. Where's your conscience in this? The conscience depends on godly knowledge, the light of coming through the window. So as a believer studies the Bible and he, he or she better understands the will of God, then his or her conscience becomes more sensitive to what is right or what is wrong. If we do not grow in spiritual understanding and knowledge and we don't obey those truths in our lives, we will have what is called a weak conscience. And that's upset very easily by even some of the most trivial things in this life. The question comes, why does it matter? If we're facing opposition, what, is, what difference does a conscience make? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. For one thing, a good conscience fortifies the believer with courage because he knows he is right with God, and as a result, he is right with man. So he doesn't have to be afraid. A good conscience removes the fear that other people may know things about us or say things against us or do things against us. When you have a guilty conscience, you spend a lot of time worrying about who knows what and what they might say and when they might say it. I have a feeling that there are still a few people in Hollywood and maybe Washington, D.C. and other places who are nervous about what someone might share about their behavior, even in the past. Every day the news seems to pop up another violator. When Jesus is the Lord of our lives and we fear only God, we don't need to fear the threats, opinions, actions, or criticisms of our enemies. In fact, the psalmist says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Peter made it clear that our conscience alone is not the test of what is right or wrong. For a person to disobey God's word and then claim, you know, like very, very confidently that their conscience doesn't convict them over this as though this is okay behavior, all that does is admit that something is radically wrong with that individual's conscience. Our conscience is a safe resource only when the word of God is its supply. Now, there was one man in the Old Testament whose conscience was clear. And he's a great example for us today in how to live when you're facing persecution. I'm talking about the prophet Daniel. The government officials in Babylon had schemed to get Daniel in trouble. You remember Daniel, he was a refugee to Babylon. He was taken from Israel to Babylon. And because of his life and his work, his witness was causing problems for all the other leaders in that area. He, he cast a negative light on them because of his goodness, his, his behavior. Daniel was one of three officials that King Darius had appointed to run the country. 
We read about this in Daniel, the sixth chapter, starting with verse three, it says, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps, that's another word for governors. There were 120 of these, these guys that by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He's going to put Daniel in charge of everything. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But listen, they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And so what they did is they went to King Darius and they said, hey, we think what we should do over the next 30 days is you should make an edict that no one should pray to any other God except you over the next 30 days. And if they do, then they should be thrown into the lion's den. And the, and the king said, sounds like a great idea. And so he issued the edict, and then all of Daniel's enemies went to Daniel's place because they knew. He prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem for God to bless him and to give thanks to the Lord. And they found him there praying, just like he always did. And they had him arrested. And they brought him before the king, and they said, hey, you violated your edict. And, and the king loved Daniel. But it was, it was law, so... He had him thrown into the lion's den. And the lion's den was just this, this secure place where hungry lions lived. And they fully expected Daniel to be torn limb from limb. But that wasn't what happened. You see, the Bible says that God sent his angel to close the mouths of the lions. And they just salivated all night long looking at Daniel. The next day, they found Daniel very much alive. And he was taken out and... Surprisingly, King Darius had his accusers thrown in, and they were torn limb from limb. Daniel was a, a guy who lived an upright life in the midst of people who persecuted him. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, he said, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you're going to do the right thing by God's will, you're going to face some opposition. Daniel's conscience led him to do what was right, even though his enemies were after him. There's one key point about our conscience that I want to share before we close, and that's if we're going to maintain this good conscience, we have to deal with sin, and we need to do it immediately. We need to confess it immediately. Don't let it linger and grow and reproduce in your life. We must also spend time in God's word and let the light in. A strong conscience is the result of obedience based upon that godly knowledge. Run the plays in God's playbook. Not just the three that we see here, but throughout his word. Run those plays. Because a strong conscience makes a strong Christian witness to those who don't believe in Jesus yet. And they need to hear him. They need to see him. They need to know about him. As the times of difficulty may come towards the church, will it be tomorrow? May it be a year from now, 10 years from now? I don't know. But we should start today cultivating a Christ-like love, revering Jesus as Lord. He is the most important. And then maintaining a good conscience. If we run these three specific plays, we'll see victories even in times of trouble and opposition and persecution. Let's be the church, church. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this promise, a reminder that uh, you, have, you have a way for us to live, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of opposition and persecution. Jesus, you faced all kinds of opposition. You were criticized, you were ridiculed, you were lied about, you were rejected, you were even executed as a common criminal and you hadn't done anything wrong. Will you prepare us, Lord, for the challenges that we may face so that your witness would be seen and heard throughout this land, even, even when we face opposition or maybe even persecution. Lord, cultivate in us that Christ-like love 
for the church, for those in this room, for our enemies, God, even for life. Lord, I pray you would develop in us this deep sense of reverence for your son. Help us, God, to maintain a pure and clear conscience so that when we're falsely accused, our life will reject those accusations and everyone will see it. That's not who he is. That's not who she is. They're the people of God. And our testimony and our witness will prevail over even the criticism and lies that others might tell about us. Lord, I pray for that person who doesn't know how much you love them today. We've been talking to the church largely through this talk, and yet I want those here who have never taken a step to put Jesus at the throne of their life to know that you love them immensely. Maybe the greatest thing we we were thankful for this weekend was what Jesus did on the cross to wash away our sins. And I pray everyone here knows that, God. Will you make sure that everyone, even people who aren't part of your family yet, know that you love them? God, I thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your all for me, for us, when you died on the cross. And thank you for overcoming the powers of hell when you came back from the dead. We praise you for that, God. Help us to be witnesses, even in the face of opposition. Help us, God, to be witnesses that will shine the light of Jesus wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.